my name is Julie Anderson. I'm the Outreach Director at Restore Justice Illinois. I have James Swansea here with me today. James was incarcerated for 28 years. He was recently released from prison, December 9th of 2020. So he was in prison during COVID. My son, Eric, is also incarcerated. He's been incarcerated for 25 years. And when COVID hit, I knew that the prisons would be one of the worst places to be in. And I was probably more frightened and nervous about COVID than any other thing that he's had to face while in prison. So I just want to ask you, James, um, where, where did you learn about COVID? And did the prison staff, were they the ones who kept you informed? Um, not at all. Um, basically, uh, while we were in Stateville, we learned about COVID through watching television, you know, and it was more or less uh, just following the news and things of that nature, you know, but as far as any staff coming around, just, you know, giving us, you know, information and things like that, that did not happen at all. Yeah, I, 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 I know that um, I had several conversations with Eric before the beginning of the pandemic when we were first hearing about it and um, just not knowing what they were gonna do. And I figured that they would go on a massive lockdown and, and close visiting, which is something they did, I believe on March 13th of 2020, um, which was hard for us because I've always visited him a lot. Um, what, what other kind of things did you see in prison that affected your daily prison life, such as commissary or? Um, well, you know, um, it's a daily flow. You know, a, a regular day is more or less like, uh, you know, you have guys that get up and go to school, you know, uh, first thing in the morning, there, there are different school lines, you know, and for those who don't, uh, go to school or have a job, you know, they run child lines. So, you know, you have uh, ample opportunities to come out the cell, you know, and uh, that was one thing that initially stopped, period. You know, nobody went anywhere, you know, and um, so that, that, that had definitely had an effect on guys because it was more so, um, you know, they, at first they didn't know what to call it. You know, at first it was an administrative lockdown, you know, which is basically has no end. You know, once they put that label on it, you know, it is what it is. And then, you know, they turned into a, a medical quarantine. So, you know, it definitely affected uh, the, the daily happenings, I guess you could say, in, 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 uh, in the institution, because, you know, nobody went anywhere. You know, if you had to go see the doctor, you know, the nurse came to you you know, more so depending on, uh, you know, what your issue was, but it definitely put everything uh, on hold instantly, you know, throughout the whole institution. You know, the only people that were coming in and out of the institution once they actually uh, put a halt to everything was the staff, you know, they shut everything down, no volunteers, uh, no visits, anything like that, so. So basically, I know, Again, for Eric, he was um, initially completely locked inside the cell for 24 hours a day. And he didn't even get a shower for three weeks. They just limited shower time and commissary time and outside yard time. Did you find that to be true for you? Uh, definitely. They, like I said, they, they, they shut everything down. They didn't run showers. Um, they uh, implemented a system as to where the uh, the staff that worked in the uh, in the commissary they actually, you know, they actually had to, you know, uh, bag the commissary up, and you know, the staff uh, they started pushing the commissary to the sale house. So they actually still allowed us to shop. You know, it was just more or less like you weren't uh, walking, or you know, there were no inmates um, that was actually working in the commissary. So initially the staff had to do everything, which in turn, you know, made everything slow. Um, you know, uh, what we were usually accomplishing commissary in a day, you know, turned into a week, 
you know, so, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, just, just slow, you know, which was really uh, frustrating to guys. So, you know, because, you know, you get used to, you know, certain things, you know, so, uh, and when it stopped, it was just more or less like, uh, it was, it was hard to deal with, you know, dealing with the pandemic and then, you know, just having certain, certain things taken away from, you, you know, it, it just got real frustrating. What happened when people got sick near you? I, that had to be, you know, pretty scary when you heard someone was sick. Did they remove them? Did they do testing on everyone around them? Well, e initially, initially when guys uh, were getting sick, they really didn't initially know what it was because initially nobody got tested. It was more so if you felt uh, like you were sick or something was bothering you, you know, they would come see you, you know, and uh, more so uh, if they did feel it was an issue to where it could be, you know, what they were suspecting as COVID, they would move you, you know, uh, they would remove you from the sale house. But before they started doing that, they just locked the whole sale house down. They wouldn't, they wouldn't remove the person that felt sick. They would just completely shut the sale house down and wouldn't allow anybody to leave out or let anybody come in. That was the first thing that they did, which I thought was so stupid you know, more so because it put everybody in danger, you know, and um, though that happened for like the first couple of weeks, you know, and, and then they did change it. You know, they did started moving. Um, they started moving guys that felt like they had symptoms out of the sale house and into uh, certain areas where they were quarantined. Did they also, if your cellmate got sick, and whether they tested them or not, they decided to remove them to quarantine. Did they give you a test? Um, if your cellmate got sick, uh, they instantly moved him and they would also move you also. It was more or less, they would move him, test him, and they would move you and test you also. So if he, if he tested positive and you didn't, he stayed in quarantine and like 48 hours later, you got to come back. I had heard a few stories from inside about people that um, were kind of afraid to get tested because uh, once they, once they kind of allowed certain workers out, they got to get out every day and everyone else was locked in. And if, you tested positive, then in fact, you would lose your job. And it was almost threatened that if you went and got a test, you might lose your job and go right into quarantine, whether you, some of them, whether you tested positive or not, just if you went and got the test. Did you feel there were any repercussions, you know, for people getting tested that, you know, they, they kind of didn't want you to get tested? Um, ultimately, uh what they started doing was, it was more or less uh, uh, the kitchen workers because in Stateville, the, the, the kitchen workers, they, they're really, uh, uh, they really don't have to uh, go through the lockdowns and everything because they don't have, uh, Stateville has nobody else to come and run the kitchen. So, you know, they have to be out. So what they did was initially, um, they had the fantastic idea of opening F house up which was, had been closed earlier, you know, due to, you know, the living conditions and things of that nature, you know, the sale house was just unhabitable. Um, so what they did was they opened F house back up and they moved the kitchen workers to F house. And anybody that didn't want to move to F house, basically, like you just said, they, they lost their job. You know, and it was more so like when they got to F House, you know, uh, if they didn't like what was going on, they basically held the job over their heads. You know, it was more so like either you deal with the situation at hand, you know, or, you know, you lose your job. And, and, and there they have rules where, you know, if you get fired from a job, you can't get a job for two years. again. So, you know, it was um, and it was just so crazy. And, uh, you know, they ultimately started using the same sale house to quarantine guys. 
you know, so they had the the corn, the guys that were actually testing positive for COVID on one side of the sale house, and they had the kitchen workers, the guys who serve the food, you know, they go to work every day on the other side of the sale house. So, you know, it was it was definitely they they weren't you know close to each other, but you still would think that they wouldn't even want these guys in anywhere near you know guys that are testing positive. So, you know, um, that's basically what they did. Now, I had a job myself and, you know, they really didn't start making it mandatory for guys to get tested till like, I want to say maybe like June or July. You know, we went a long time without having to get tested, you know, but, you know, uh, right before I left, that it was mandatory that guys were getting tested. They were testing the workers every two weeks. So, you know, the, the longer the pandemic went on, the better, you know, they started handling the situation. But initially it was uh, it was all over the place. They really didn't know how to do or whatever it was that they felt they needed to do. They didn't it wasn't implemented correctly. They didn't have a plan. I, you know, I think that um, when we talk about isolating the kitchen workers and then putting people who were COVID positive in isolation in the same cell house, which was a condemned cell house. I know F house was condemned because it was so bad, broken windows, um, improper heating. If you had COVID tested positive for COVID, you were in F house. Did staff yes. interact with both groups? And yes. They masked? Yes, they, they, they did interact with both groups and they were masked. Um, they um they didn't like it but at the same time i think they were kind of held like to the same standards you know it was more or less like it's an assignment you know so uh you know when they came in that morning you know they basically told they were told that you know you got f house today you know so the majority of the time though if they didn't have to go on the gallery they wouldn't you know it was more so you know they would do uh, 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 as little as possible, you know, to deal with, you know, whether it was the kitchen workers or the other guys, you know, because they had to walk the nurses, they had to walk the the temp nurses, you know, and things of that nature. So they did as less they did as less as possible, but they did uh, uh, have to interact, and they were uh, masked. Well, that part's that part's good and um, surprising. I've heard in other facilities, the staff wasn't really so um, so good about putting masks on, especially when they were with each other. If they were in a separate room with just staff, you know, and there were six staff members in a close proximity, a lot of times they didn't mask up at all. They just sat there and talked and did whatever they did. Yeah, that's true. I, I can say that when they were around each other, they weren't masked up. So it was more or less like they, uh, you know, made it seem like it was safe to, around, to be around each other, but not safe to be around us. Yeah, and they're actually the people who introduced COVID inside the prisons. Exactly. It's so close. It's such a close proximity. And the healthcare is so bad. It just, you just knew when it got in there that it was gonna spread. And initially when COVID came in in March, it was in the US before that, but I think the public really got a whiff of it in March, mid-March. And as we went on a few months and adjusted to it and testing originally was very, very limited. You had to have symptoms, you had to have a note, whatever. But then it became available for everyone. And many states started vaccinating their entire prison population, I mean, not vaccinating, started testing the entire prison population because the only way to know what type of problem you have is to test and see if you have that problem. And Restore Justice in August, we began a campaign to get the governor and the director's staff to begin testing every single person that took months, which is, you know, just typical of the way the, our bureaucracy works. So in December, they began testing. We know Stateville had an early outbreak, and that was evident. We lost lives there. People who weren't sentenced to die in prison died in prison. Um, family members weren't really properly notifi notified. Many people were in the hospital, and their family didn't even know, and they died alone. 
But once we started testing, then all of a sudden there was a, a big outbreak, right? Which of course the outbreak was probably there. So they started testing everyone in, in December, mandatorily every two weeks. And did you see them taking measures where actually the testing actually helped to decrease? Well, you got out in early December, so. Actually, the um, actually the 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 mandatory testing in December was for everybody, right, in the yeah. institution. But months before that, they started testing everybody that had a, a job that came out. You know, it was mandatory that you had to get tested in order for you to continue, you know, to work. And um, it definitely helped, um, you know, uh, because like uh, initially, initially uh, when it when it hit it was big and you know um like from i want to say from the beginning which uh was like um march 15th um you know that's that was the first i was in the sale house that that uh, was initially put on quarantine and um so that's really when it started in stateville so from like march to maybe like may you know that's when it was you know it was really scary for guys you know because although guys um, you know, we looking at the news, but you know, you hearing the rumors of everybody who's been going to the outside hospital and guys are dying, and you know, and and the news, you know, is depicting it like you know, it's it's not really that many people, but you have the staff coming back, you know, telling you, you know, such and such just died, you know, such and such is in the hospital, and then that's when it really started taking a turn for the worse in the media. You know, because the media started getting wind of, you know, of all these inmates that were going to the outside hospital, you know, and it was more or less um, uh, the hospital actually started turning guys around, you know, and sending guys back, you know, so um, it was uh, the like the first four or five months, you know, it was it was really scary for guys, you know, because nobody knew what to do, you know, and it was almost like um, you really had to fend for yourself. You know, you just had to make sure that, you know, your area was clean and you know what I'm saying, things of that nature and make sure that you were doing the right things to protect yourself. So, but as time went on, you know, things got better as far as uh, the staff and the, the institution in itself starting to help guys, you know, but initially it was, it was rough. I think it was really rough. And that's one of the things you have so little control of things when you're inside prison. And as an outside family member, you really don't have any control over anything. And you really didn't have any control over your environment and who was getting COVID and how they were spreading it, if officers were wearing masks, if they were passing out food. So to me, it had to be to be really, really scary. And I know that um, they really limited um, hand sanitizers. So that had to be hard too. I also know that they had a big a big stop on yard time, even in the summer, did you get to go outside much? Because that's the one place that I think most people felt safe was being outside. Uh, initially, yeah, they they had cut the yard out and it was more so, you know, that was one of the, uh, the guy, a lot of the guys, that was the big issue. You know, it was more so like, uh, you know, how do you expect things to get better when you just leaving us cooped up together? You know, and uh, so uh, they initially started a plan, you know, initially they were letting, uh, when they started running yard back, they would send half a gallery at a time, you know, and it was protocols that you had to go through. You had to get your temperature checked in the morning. Um, you had to have a mask. It was certain things you couldn't take. Um, when you got out there, it was certain activities you couldn't do, you know, so it was more or less, they were giving guys the opportunity to get outside, but they also took a lot of things away at the same time. So, um, and the first trial run of that, it lasted about a week because after the first week, uh, it was a spike in, uh, in guys uh, testing positive. You know, uh, it was like, uh, maybe I wanna say like six or eight guys tested positive right behind us. So they shut that down instantly. You know, and they and they 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 wanted to uh, reroute and try some things. So initially they, but eventually they did start running it back. But you know, it, it took them a while to get things uh, 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 together. You know, because 
at the same time, one of the big things is also that, you know, you have so many people in control, you know, and some people, uh, uh, some of the staff uh, wanted to, you know, let guys go outside and then you have others that didn't want to. So, you know, coming down as far as the chain of command from the warden to the assistant wardens and, you know, you have the majors and, the, you know, the lieutenants, you have so many people that have so much say so, you know, so, so guys are really just stuck. You know, when it comes to that, they, they really didn't ask us our opinion. And I know, you know what, the facilities are different. Um, Illinois River, uh, they went two and three months without yard. You know, Menard brought yard back a little bit quicker than some of the other facilities. But again, it was slow because we're talking like they were already six months into the pandemic and and they weren't really, I don't think they were trying to bring back a lot of things they could have. I know school has been in classes. Did, were you, I know that was real limited for a lot of people. Um, Eric was taking a class, you know, and uh, his teacher quit. So <laughs> that was the end of the class. They just didn't find anyone to replace her and they were doing it what they would do, and I think that they do this in Stateville also, where they would bring the assignments in and drop them off at the cells and then pick up your assignment after you were done. So at least it gave you something to do, right? Um, but then the teacher quits and they don't try to find anyone to replace the teacher or, or anything like that. Did you, did you guys run into that at Stateville? Because they have a pretty good program in Stateville for some classes, more so than other prisons. Basically, it was the same thing. Uh, uh, initially, um, you know, it was just cut, you know, and guys really didn't know what was going on because they weren't allowing any volunteers or any teachers to come in at all. And uh, once the teachers actually started, uh, uh, once they actually let the teachers start coming back in, you know, that's when the assignments started coming through the mail. You know, they would, uh, they would uh, uh, designate certain days that they would pick them up. You know, they would pick the the assignments up in the morning, you know, and then later on that day, drop the assignments off. So uh, once that started happening, then uh, it started happening with the with the rest of the programs also. So uh, so everything was going through the mail, you know, and they were coming to pick everything up. So that was something good, you know. In essence, it gave guys something to do, you know. Although they weren't able to leave the cell, they still, you know, were able to focus and 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 to continue you know, trying to get their education and, you know, uh, finishing up classes that they were actually in. Now, as far as visiting, they stopped visiting March 14th, 13th or 14th of 2020 for everyone. Um, no efforts were made to bring back any type of visiting all summer long outside. So people were without their family. Um, they shortened video visits, video visits to 15 minutes, which prior to that it was 45 minutes or an hour, but they felt it would be very crowded on the video visits. So they shortened them to 15 minutes at a cost of $3.75 to have the video visit. And what happened during video visits is it wasn't crowded. You could get a video visit anytime you wanted. The family member could book at any time. I know. Some of the guys had a hard time getting out of the cell to get to their video visit. And one of the big things about those visits is the technology is very poor. The picture pixelates all the time. The sound comes in and out. And when you complain to the facility, they say it's the GTL, the provider of it. And GTL says it's the facility. So this has gone on for a year. And the video visits have not improved. Yet we've all been doing Zoom like crazy. Did did you have struggles with that? I just think the visiting had to be. And phone calls, again, phone calls are something we've battled for years. The phones are limited. There's only four to five to six phones on a gallery at a very limited amount of time to use them. If you can use them. I know I went three weeks at a time sometimes not hearing from Eric. Did they try to put in any additional phones so that people could contact their family? No, not at all. Um, and the biggest thing, you know, the way the phones are ran in Stateville, you know, uh, they're basically passed down the gallery. 
So, you know, each individual, you know, is able to pull the phone in that cell. And what started happening was, you know, guys would, you know, be extra uh, cautious. So they would clean the phone. And what would happen was guys would continually mess the phone up because, you know, uh, liquid would get inside the phone and, you know, it would. So, you know, that was another battle. You know, guys, were, uh, the phones were always messing up. And as far as the video visits, uh, it was just like you said, you know, they would blame it on GTL and GTL would blame it on the facility, you know, and uh, because they were all, they would always say that, you know, Stateville, you know, it's, it's like a dinosaur, you know, uh, Stateville is not ready for the new technology, you know, the, the actual uh, uh, facility uh, uh, just isn't ready, you know, so uh, it was the last to receive, you know, like the tablets and, uh, you know, the things of that nature. So, you know, it's, it's just an old facility. So it was, that definitely was an issue, you know, and that, and that became frustrating the guys, you know, you know, for 15, I, I have 15 minutes and, you know, uh, if I have a video visit at 8.15, you know, the, the staff, they'll, they'll get there at like 8.13, you know, and it's more so, you know, that's frustrating because you have to yell and, you know, so, uh, it's, it, it just leads to so much other BS, you know, so everything can be ran uh, better, you know, uh, they didn't have a system for anything. It was just on the fly. They didn't. I know Stateville's old, but Hill, Lawrence, um, Illinois River, Mount Sterling, they're all not as old. <laughs> Let's put it that way. They're built in the 90s, so they're about 30, 40 years old, but they too, um, they had video problems. Uh, many times a 15 minute call, you couldn't hear for like seven to eight minutes of it. So you're just frustrated by the end of it and it goes in and out. Um, and then in-person visits, again, I said they didn't try to do any type of outside, even though Cook County last summer did do outside visits for family members. Um, Illinois Department of Corrections did not make any efforts to do that. and now they've decided to do non-contact in-person visits and limit them to two hours and two a month. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or anything you think? Because I think that after families waited a year and many have gotten vaccinated and many of the guys inside have gotten vaccinated, vaccinated so they could visit in person. And now they're going to have a non-contact visit. How do you think that's going to be received? Well, initially, uh, they're going to get a lot of pushback from that because, you know, it's more or less like um, non-contact visits are usually for individuals who have gotten in trouble, you know, uh, uh, seg status or things of that nature. So, you know, why am I being, you know, put behind this big old plexiglass when I've done nothing wrong? You know, so although it is going to be good to get the chance to see your loved ones and things of that nature, you know, it's more or less like, you know, guys are going to want more because it has been so long. You know, you're telling me I've went through all this for a year and now I still have to overcome this obstacle, you know, and um, but it's definitely a start. You're going to have some guys that's going to look at it as, you know, positive because guys are moving forward, but you're going to have a lot of guys that are still frustrated, you know, and that's understandable. You know, because like I said before, it's uh that's basically designated for guys who are uh getting who, who who get in trouble, you know. So if I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do, then I'm supposed to get what I I have coming to me, which is a non-contact visit, you know. So yeah, I see it, I see it as um they had they started this last fall, you know, people would have been more appreciative of it probably or more accepting but to start it when vaccines are just about ready for everyone in the U.S. to have them available to them and to be able to get them and and their big thing is um, they have a lot of criteria for family members to go through to visit so perhaps you're six hours away and you're going to drive six hours for a two-hour visit that doesn't allow you any contact that's kind of a hard thing and you have to be masked and you have to do this and yet staff is in and out and I understand 
over 70% of the staff has not been vaccinated, but they're in and out every single day. So I think it's going to be pretty frustrating for people. So I don't, I don't know that the DOC has any plans yet to bring back contact, full contact visits. Yeah, that, um, that's definitely going to be a slippery slope, you know, because I think that's the main issue. You know, you have people that have to travel a long way, you know, and, uh, to see their loved ones. So it's, it's, it's kind of going to uh, deter some people. You know, which is sad, but you know, at the same time, it's you know, it's understandable. You know, you're gonna have people like, well, why should I drive six hours for a two-hour visit when I'm not even gonna be able to touch? Them? You know, that's the biggest part. Sound. I was just saying, then you have the sound quality. State yeah. living room is horrific for sound normally, without a piece of plexiglass. You, <laughs> you can't. The way it's set up, you can't hear. You can't hear, yeah. And they're, and they're like literally like two feet in front of you. And you still yeah. can't hear them. It's yeah, crazy. So, so yeah. I just, and I have a couple family members who are elderly and they have hearing issues. So I don't know, you know, how that's really going to play out with that plexiglass at all because they're not putting any kind of phone thing or anything to, you know, which would be super expensive, but any kind of vent thing that you would, speak through or anything. And I know from county doing those, those visits through plexiglasses, that's been difficult to hear. It's usually, a, and my husband doesn't hear well. And when we would go visit Eric when he was at county, Eric would say something and then I would have to repeat it to my husband <laughs> because he couldn't right. hear what he said. So I think we're gonna have a lot of that. Um, you Definitely. know, lastly, though, I did wanna touch on, um, how it was getting out during COVID, because that had to be, it's a little bit strange. It's not, it's not normal, right? Like, no, you have definitely wasn't. Um, no, no, uh, um, actually, because, you know, ultimately, I think my freedom outweighed everything else. <laughs> you know, I think I was more or less like, uh, you know, I'd be willing to deal with whatever it is that I had to deal with, you know, as long as I know I wasn't dealing with it on the inside. You know, I think um, I looked at it as being easier. You know, uh, there were more things that I could do to protect myself, you know, because I had more control, you know, now that I'm out, you know, uh, like you said, you know, it's just some things you had no control over, you know, so, you know, I can control, you know, if I feel somebody's too close to me or, you know, I can have my hand sanitized, or, you know, I can, there's more things that I can do to help me protect myself from everybody else, or, you know, just ultimately stay safe. So um, they basically, uh, the, the uh, me getting out was basically the same thing, you know, I just signing paperwork and everything and just, uh, they basically let me know what I had to do to protect myself and things of that nature. But you know, ultimately, it was just, uh, you know, them letting me know certain things. But um, uh, it definitely was uh, different, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, I enjoyed it just as much as I would have enjoyed it if I would have came home, you know, pre-COVID or, you know, when it's over. But, you know, I've actually enjoyed myself. And, uh, you know, it's uh, I just want to uh, take the chance to, you know, uh, let people know how it is on the inside, you know, because a lot of people don't know, you know, they, they really don't understand what those guys are going through on the inside. So, you know, the vaccination, you know, that's very important. That's a very important step for a lot of guys, you know, to, to get the institution back running normal. So, you know, that's why you have a lot of guys that are taking it, you know, and I think, um, I think IDOC needs to take a big, hard look at you know doing something to make it mandatory for the staff to do the same thing. Yeah, I agree. I um I think vaccinations um that the population has really inside has really rallied. They're just about at 70%. Of course, we could get up higher. I applaud like the governor for um making room for all inmates to to be able to get the vaccination. I, th I think that was huge. I know that he did that with some pushback, but people in prison are our most vulnerable members of society. They just absolutely, the healthcare is so terrible. 
that if you do get COVID, it's super scary and it's scary for family members. Um, Restore Justice has really, we've really been on about originally getting testing, super important to us that everyone get tested regularly. Because again, you don't know what kind of problem. I've had several facilities tell me, well, we really didn't have much of a problem till, you know, like December till recently. And I'm thinking, well, because you didn't do any testing. Like when we would look at the number of tests, you had a hundred percent positivity rate because you only tested people who were super sick, right? But, and we've also been, um, Restore Justice has also been really on about vaccines and we really urged the governor to allow the vaccines. And I know some people are hesitant, but my way of thinking is if you care about the people around you, you get vaccinated to help them, if not yourself. And I'm very disappointed that the staff hasn't taken that outlook, that they would be helping the people that they work with. It's so, but in upon re-entry was a little bit weird, like trying to get your IDs and stuff and register. And I know they have a lot of rules on things you have to follow and, you know, probation officer and things like that. Was that kind of, kind of hard? Um, it was, it was definitely an adventure, uh, you know, just having to stand in line you know, two and a half, three hours because, you know, uh, by uh, COVID shutting everything down, you had people, you know, once uh, the Secretary of State offices actually opened back up, you had so many people that were trying to, you know, get their IDs, get their driver's license and things of that nature. So that was definitely new for me. And plus it was cold. So, you know, uh, that was, <laughs> it wasn't any fun at all, but uh, I got it done and, uh, you know, it uh, it was definitely a necessity for me, you know, coming home. I, that was definitely something I needed. So, you know, it was worth it. You know, I, I made it worth my while, you know, just in, just enjoying it. You know, it was almost like, a, you know, just another step in the journey, me trying to, you know, re-enter society and, and get back to where I'm trying to be. So it was cool. It wasn't a big thing. That's good. And I would imagine, to wrap this up, that getting out of prison with the COVID pandemic aside from wanting to get out and get your freedom back, it's just gotta be a huge relief because again, you can be in charge of your own healthcare then. You can decide where you wanna go, how close you wanna be to people, um, if you wanna go to a store or anything like that. You, you're able to make those decisions because I found during COVID that everyone has a different set of risk factors that they're willing to accept. You know, I may go to the grocery store, but I won't go to a restaurant or, or whatever that is. And they, and over the year, we have all adapted to these risk factors that we're willing. But when you're in prison, you don't have that choice. You don't have the luxury of, I'm willing to accept this risk factor, but not that one, because the risk factors are there in your face all the time. So we're glad you're back. Thank you. I'm definitely glad to be back. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's like you said. It when you when you're on the inside, you really have no control over. You know, you could be in a cell by yourself. You know, and ultimately, if they need that space, you know, they have to put somebody in there with you. You know, so you know that's one thing you have no control over. So you know, by being home, you know, I ultimately can control who I want to be around as opposed to who I don't. You know, I don't have to worry about somebody coming through my door. You know, that's <laughs> you know so. That's, I think that's ultimately the biggest thing. You know, uh, I have more, way more control over certain things than I did when, I'm, when I was on the inside. Thank you. No problem, I enjoyed this. This was, this was great. <laughs>